<laughs> so I hope he's up right after this so I can see him. And it's great to be here as we launch into this National Day of Glass. And I'm really thrilled to have the opportunity to join you in celebration of what I, for one, believe is one of the world's most transformative materials. Now, at Corning, we spend an enormous amount of time, talent, and treasure working with glass. And we love how it forms, how it feels, how it handles light, and how it takes on color. Most of all, we love how alive <clears throat> glass is, how artists and designers make it breathe and dance and sing, and how scientists and engineers use it to solve many of the world's toughest challenges. How glass objects are among the oldest man-made materials, most likely dating back well before 4000 BC. And the more we've evolved its form and its function, the deeper glass has made its way into all of our lives. And I go so far as to say that glass <coughs> is vital to human progress. Now today, I want to focus on four key attributes of this material that I love that make it such a powerful problem solver. I'll highlight how we take advantage of its stability, build on its inherent strength, and control its interaction with light, and how we harness its impermeability. Now through this lens, I'll discuss the many ways we've unlocked the power of glass over time. And I'll share some new technologies that innovators are bringing to life, all of which lead me to believe that glass will be ever more critical in all of our futures. So let's dive in. First, consider stability. Silicate glasses feature a randomly linked network of silicate oxygen bonds that remain mostly intact from the time the component sand is mined through the entire life cycle of the material. Consequently, glass can endure for millennia. Now, many of you may have heard the rather amusing claim that glass windows in medieval cathedrals are thicker at the bottom than the top uh, because glass is a liquid that flows over time. Uh, but this is just really simply a result of how the windows were manufactured. And then, of course, the craftsmen logically installed them in a way for maximum structural integrity. In fact, it would take many, many, many times the age of Earth for gravity to create a visible change in the thickness of a glass window. Now, while glass is stable at the macro level, it can change a lot at the micro level. Compositional impurities in glass can cause it to expand when heated and contract when cooled. Now that is often not a very desirable attribute. Uh, it can lead to the breakage of certain glass types when they're heated or cooled rapidly. Uh, but we've made significant advancements in thermal stability over time. One breakthrough began in the 15th century Venice, where glassmakers began importing plant ash from Spain as a new source of alkali. It contains significant amounts of calcium and magnesium. At the same time, advances in filtering and recrystallization improved the ash purity. These combined factors resulted in a far more transparent and colorless glass. People quickly discovered that it also offered unprecedented chemical durability, and it held up better under rapid temperature changes. Chemists could now isolate important materials in pure forms for the very first time, 
most notably alcohol and mineral acids. This accelerated the evolution of both chemistry and medicine. Historians also believe that this better glass accelerated improvements in eyeglasses, which helped popularize reading and the sharing of ideas following the invention of the printing press. Now, uh, flash forward to the 1920s, when the astronomer George Hale began planning the world's largest telescope, which he would construct in Palomar, California. To ensure accurate images of the stars, Hale needed a gigantic glass disk with a low coefficient of expansion. Now, Corning supplied our Pyrex glass, which you see here on the train, right? <laughs> which was already well known for its thermal stability. But more importantly, our research on the project led to a discovery that ended up revolutionizing the way that we manufacture glass. A young scientist named Frank Hyde decided to skip the melting of sand. Instead, he synthesized the components of glass from liquid chemicals, a process we now call vapor deposition. In so doing, he learned to improve the purity of glass to an unprecedented degree. Hyde sprayed liquid silicon tetrachloride into the flame of a welder's torch. It reacted with the water vapor produced by the burning fuel and oxygen in the air to form fused silica. This material is remarkably transparent due to its purity. In fact, you can think of it as the simplest and purest of all glasses. It is composed merely of silicon and oxygen. But making it requires sophisticated capabilities. And because of its chemical composition and its very strong covalent bonds, it expands and contracts very little with changes in temperature. Now, our understanding of thermal expansion has enabled a host of vital advancements. We created glass for televisions and smartphones that provides excellent dimensional stability, even during high temperature fabrication steps. Mirrors for space telescopes from Hubble and Kepler to the recently launched James Webb, capable of withstanding extreme cold and pressure, same for spacecraft windows. And ultra low expansion glass, which is essential for modern semiconductor manufacturing techniques, especially extreme ultraviolet lithography. Now let's consider glass strength. Now, at least historically, people often thought of glass as fragile. Here's an image of a 17th century wine bottle <coughs> encased in a straw basket. Now, the not so good idea behind this was that the straw would provide protection, making the glass bottle less likely to break. In actuality, uh, this approach didn't work too well. The bottles became known as fiascos. Uh, now some language experts link popular opinion at that time about fiascos uh, with our use of the word fiasco today. Enter the British. England was running out of timber for its navy and in 1615 restricted the use of wood to only the most essential purposes. As you can see, uh, the king's proclamation was pretty clear. Glassmakers quickly switched to coal-fired furnaces. And over time, what they learned is that coal furnaces burn hotter. This allowed them to melt glasses with higher silica content and to make thicker bottles. Now both, of these attributes increased the strength of their bottles. So no more 
straw baskets. But perhaps even more importantly, stronger bottles contributed to the birth of one of my favorite new fields. Winemakers had been experimenting with adding a dose of sugar to induce a second fermentation that resulted in bubbles in the wine. The discovery of champagne was underway, but there was a problem. The method created pressure that caused many bottles to explode. England's coal-fired bottles solved that problem, and the modern champagne industry was born. Talk about glass being vital to human progress. <laughs> <laughs> so largely through serendipity, the British found a way to create stronger glass. Now, can we make advances in glass strength more scientifically? Well, first, I need to point out that glass is actually, inherently, incredibly strong. Scientists estimate that its theoretical strength is about 15 gigapascals. Now, to put that in perspective, think of it this way. Imagine a scale that measures the pressure under an elephant's foot. To get this scale to read one gigapascal, you would need to stack 10,000 elephants on top of each other. Well, if we're that inherently strong, how does glass break? Well, the breakage occurs when sufficient tensile strength stress is applied to a flaw, such as a scratch or a chip, on the surface. This test illustrates the impact of a flaw in a dramatic way. Now, according, we've advanced over the years multiple techniques to address this. One key process is called ion exchange. We immerse glass parts in a molten salt solution. Potassium ion migrate into the glass surface, exchanging with smaller sodium ions original to the glass. The replacement of smaller ions with larger ions literally causes the exchange region of the glass to expand. This creates a compressive stress layer that makes surface flaw propagation and thus breaks much less likely. Now, how has this technique actually played out in your life? Well, 15 years ago, uh, Steve Jobs challenged us to create a cover material for the first iPhone. It needed to be transparent, and it needed to be damage and scratch resistance. Plastic didn't work, so we developed a tough, durable glass solution. Our work led to Gorilla Glass, which has helped revolutionize the way we all communicate. It has now been deployed on more than 8 billion devices worldwide. And we've consistently innovated on the original version. We are nearly 20 generations of material into this innovation. And our glass ceramic invention, which is marketed by Apple as Ceramic Shield, is an order of magnitude more damage resistant than the cover glass that we introduced in 2007. Now these are important advancements, but we are not done because glass still breaks and we are far from the theoretical strength of glass. And think of all the places in your life you wish you had glass that didn't break. Uh, today, we're bringing precision glass to bear in these areas and helping to advance exciting new technologies. We need solar panels for us that can withstand the elements as well as the rigors of installation. And the strength of glass will be critical on the journey to autonomous vehicles. Today's semi-autonomous technologies rely on multiple cameras and sensors behind the windshields or other covers. If the windshield cracks, replacing it is challenging because the sensors would need to be entirely recalibrated. A more damage-resistant windshield 
and durable, optically optimized covers for other autonomy sensors will likely be major contributions of glass to the birth of yet another new technology. Next, consider the interaction of glass with light. Now this has been a focus for artists for thousands of years, and we've made tremendous strides in learning how to manipulate the relationship between glass and light. In the 14th century, advancements in the production of transparent glass led to wider adoption of windows in homes. People started letting in the sunlight while keeping out cold, wind, and rain. When Venetians produced the first mirrors a century later, artists began to paint self-portraits, and people began to explore the concept of self. And around 1600, breakthroughs in lens technology led to the telescope and the microscope. In recent time, uh, we've built tremendous knowledge of two mechanisms governing the interaction between light and glass, refraction and scattering. First, by definition, the index of refraction is the ratio of the speed of light in a vacuum to the speed of light in the material of interest. Now this is a critical parameter in part because light always follows the path of least time. So here's an analogy. A lifeguard wants to save a swimmer who is in trouble. Of course, the lifeguard needs to reach the swimmer in the least amount of time necessary. Now he's faster running on the sand than he is in swimming to make the rescue. So the lifeguard doesn't just proceed in a straight line. Instead, he chooses to run a bit farther on the land than swim to reach that swimmer. The optimal path is determined by the ratio of the lifeguard's running speed to his swimming speed. Now this is a core principle of lens design. Light is focused by curving a lens in the right way, given the index of refraction of the lens material, and target performance parameters such as focal length and magnification. Everyday examples of applications here are your high glasses and your smartphone camera. Looking forward though, very high index glass is enabling next generation augmented reality devices, helping deliver larger, clearer images which create more engaging and immersive experiences for viewers. Now let's consider the second important mechanism that I noted for controlling the interaction between light and glass, <laughs> scattering. Now for centuries, the Lycurgus cup confounded observers with its mysterious ability to appear jade green when lit from the front and ruby red when lit from the inside. Now, the cup was created in the fourth century, but people didn't understand until relatively recently that the effect was caused by the presence of nanometer silver and gold particles. When viewed in reflected light, the nanoscale metallic particles reflect shorter wavelengths and transmit longer wavelengths. And the cup appears green to the viewer. When the light originates inside the cup, fine particles scatter the blue end of the spectrum more effectively than the red end, resulting in red transmission. And this is the color observed. Now in general, scattering occurs due to local compositional variations, and as I illustrated with the lifeguard, density or <coughs> dimensional variation. Uh, this finding led to a communications revolution. It began in the 1960s. Scientists around the world were grappling with a challenge, how to transmit enormous amounts of data and conversations over distance at low cost. The world needed 
a superior alternative to radio waves and copper cables. Mm. There was a theory that glass fiber could be the solution if the signal loss was sufficiently low. At the time, the only existing application of such a glass fiber involved light intensifiers inside TVs, computers, and medical equipment. But after 20 meters, around 65 feet, these fibers attenuated their signal almost entirely. So the world needed a glass fiber that could carry light at a loss of fewer than 20 decibels per kilometer. In other words, if 100 units of light went in, at least one would need to come out one kilometer later. Now that challenge was posted according by the, uh, no pun intended, by the British Post Office, uh, which was responsible, believe it or not, for the United Kingdom's telephone system. Our scientists quickly determined that there were multiple factors causing the signal loss. They knew, of course, that impurities in glass absorb the injected light. And they found that compositional density and dimensional variations also <coughs> cause signal loss through scattering. But the next challenge was that a perfectly transmitting homogeneous glass fiber radiates light if it is bent. So light needs a guide to stay inside the glass. One option is a highly transmissive core surrounded by glass cladding with its index of refraction tuned to make sure the fastest path from A to B is always staying inside the core. In order for the waveguide to work, the index profile of the fiber needs to create total internal reflection and thereby keep all of the injected light inside the core. Now, to tackle these challenges, according scientists, experimented with our very pure fused silica glass. As it turned out, its purity actually created a challenge for the cladding because no other glass would adhere to the core. So they decided to also use fused silica as the cladding. But remember, the core needs a refractive index higher than the cladding to create internal reflection. So our scientists came up with a way to add elements to the composition of the core glass. Their favorites were titanium and germanium. And they invented a process to combine the core and cladding seamlessly. One faded afternoon in August of 1970, they tested a sample. And the light pulsing through a new fiber measured between 16 and 17 decibels of loss. The physicist conducting the test uh, summed it up best. This is his lab notebook that day. Uh, he summed it up with the totally understood deep scientific term, whoopee. <laughs> <laughs> This invention was capable of carrying 65,000 times more information than copper wire. That August afternoon marked the start of a telecommunications revolution. Today, optical fiber is at the heart of a global network that connects us all. One metric of the impact on society is that to date, the world has deployed over 5 billion kilometers of optical fiber. Now that's enough to travel to the sun and back about 17 times. And it is quite a testament to the potential of glass. Now we've made great improvements over time as we've researched additional methods to eliminate impurities, and compositional density, and dimensional variations that cause signal loss. The evolution of our paper deposition technique now provides glass that is 40,000 times clearer than a high-grade diamond. It's so pure that if you filled the entire Indian Ocean, which is four kilometers deep on average, with fiber-quality glass, you could see the bottom from your boat. 
sitting on top of this solid hunk <laughs> of Indian Ocean. And fibers fabricated using precision forming techniques. In fact, it is one of the most precise objects ever produced by humans. An optical fiber is about the diameter of a human hair and has a roughness of about an atom. So if the earth were that smooth, there would be no mountains taller than a double-decker bus. And even though today's optical fiber transmits light more than 100 times better than the original low-loss fiber, there's still so much more to do. Consider quantum communications. The basic idea is to create fully secure communications using single photons entangle in the laws of quantum mechanics. Now this can only work if the optical fiber is free of impurities and sufficiently uniform that the odds of losing that photon are extremely low. We've made optical fibers that can support quantum information transport up to 509 kilometers. So obviously there is a lot more for quantum communications and fiber to do before this can become an ubiquitous communication medium for the world or even a nation. Now I want to introduce one more key property of glass. It's natural impermeability. A molecule of oxygen takes about two weeks to pass through a high-tech plastic a millimeter thick. That same oxygen molecule would take about five trillion years to pass through one millimeter of silicon glass. So as a result, glass has been used for thousands of years as a container because of its effectiveness in protecting contents from contamination by the surrounding environment. But I'd like to focus on what I, I consider to be very relevant uh, given the, the COVID pandemic, new use of glass. Uh, we're applying our understanding of impermeability and the other properties I've discussed to advance the pharmaceutical packaging industry. It's easy to take pharmaceutical glass vessels for granted. After all, we're often way more focused on what's inside than the package itself. Now, for about a century, the industry has used borosilicate glass vials. Uh, but a few years ago, a host of issues emerged with this material namely in the areas of delamination, breakage, and cracks, particulate, and throughput. Injectable drugs have become very sophisticated, and they often feature precise formulations that must be kept extremely stable. And many need to be stored at very cold temperatures. Uh, the drug manufacturing process has also changed a lot, including the use of high-speed filling lines for vials and cartridges, and many of the vials are washed at high temperatures. So what we had asked ourselves is, given all these changes in drug manufacturing, what are the odds that a material that was last invented 100 years ago continues to be as relevant as we need for human health? Now, it turns out that borosilicate glass is, though it's a great material, is prone to breakage in the generation of particulates during vial-to-vial -vial manufacturing contact on that pharmaceutical filling line, and it's susceptible to heat and cold. It's also susceptible to changes in surface chemistry that can lead to the formation of tiny little fragments of corroded glass that are shed from a container into the product. In total, these issues hamper the efficiency for drug makers and could lead to a shortage of vital medicines for patients. So we responded with a new glass composition. The inventor's actually in the audience today designed to protect patients and address manufacturing bottlenecks. Now our new glass offers exceptional strength to reduce breakage and enhance chemical stability to help maintain the integrity of life savings molecules that it will ultimately carry. Now our luminous silicate composition became the first and only fundamentally new glass to be approved by the US FDA as a primary package for a marketed drug in more than 100 years. And when the pandemic hit, 
this class showed its strength as we ramped capacity and worked with drug makers to help them develop and deliver vaccines. And I'm proud to share that so far our portfolio of vials and tubing has enabled the delivery of more than 5 billion doses of the COVID-19 vaccine globally. Looking to the future, it's innovations like these that will allow us to picture a world in which glass effectively increases global gl drug capacity by preventing DLAM and particulates, reducing breakage, holding up under temperature changes, and accelerating throughput. This means more vaccines get to where they need to go faster and more reliably. More people can be treated as costs go down and shelf life goes up. So simply put, I, I think, obviously, I think, like glass is amazing. <laughs> so the question is, what will happen as we continue to unlock its mysteries today? Scientists have added about 70 other elements to silicate glass to create unique compositions with different capabilities. But we have much more room to explore. I mean, consider the variety of music that can be produced using a grand piano. Infinite art from only 88 keys. The same can be true for glass. So, as we move to the rest of today's agenda, I urge you, think of the possibilities. Our journey to unlock the potential of glass is just beginning. And I welcome all of you to join us. From addressing climate change to progressing healthcare to advancing communications and computing, I believe the cloud glass remains and will be even more so in the future vital to human progress. And I'm confident its biggest contributions lie ahead. So thank you.